Hello everybody and welcome to our June monthly chat. And if you hear a little bit of an echo behind us, yes, we're still having trouble with sound. So I hope you can bear with us and uh, just put up with it. You might say we have a habit of repeating ourselves. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully we can get through this. And because this varying and repeating color is such an important uh, concept, principle, thing that we do in our paintings that can make all the difference in the world and how intriguing or exciting our paintings can be. And if we don't use the repeating and invariant, our painting is gonna be kind of boring. So it's gonna be interesting. Some of you, most of you probably are already doing repeating and varying and don't even know it. Okay, just as a uh, little bit of a uh, warm up, uh, what, what we call it, they call it half something anyway. Um, the, the way the whole thing works, as those of you who are regulars know, is that uh, we will see an intro video. There, I always make a little video at the beginning of these chats to lay the concept out for you and break it down for you uh, so that it can get your mental juices going uh, on whatever the topic is, and then we'll flesh it out in the discussion after the video's over. Uh, and then, as far as the questions go, as you know, only the Studio Insiders uh, will be able to ask questions because we do have uh, end up having quite a number of people join us on these chats, and if we don't limit it somehow, they come in so fast I can't see them all. And so the Studio Insiders can ask questions and if you're not a studio insider and you want to be one, uh, asking questions is not the only advantage you have. Every month, you also get a free video lesson from our lessons website at dianemice.com. So we have those free video lessons, a new lesson, new free lesson every single month for as long as you're a studio insider member. And uh, we, you also, uh, get the little extra, the uh, excerpts that Roger sends out every second Sunday. And then of course you get the, get to, to um, carry on the conversation with us here. To become a Studio Insider member, if you, you right now are on our channel website in order to watch this most likely. And uh, depending on what kind of device you're on, if you're on a laptop or a, or a tablet, you probably can see the menu uh, and you'll see in that menu the word join and you hit that it's $4.99 a month for as long as you remember and so that takes care of that. All right, looks like we are gathering the natives, <laughs> gathering our forces together uh, and so we'll go ahead and, and get started with the video. Do I need to, uh, did I, is there something else I need to open with Roger? Uh, I don't need to open with anything else. Never mind. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started with the video. Uh, now, pay attention, if you can, to the ways I'm showing you that you can repeat and vary. I'll kind of break this down for you. Uh, you might not have thought about it before, that you really there are really methods that you can use to repeat and vary, uh, a, intentional methods that can... Uh, act that can work for you as great tools. Uh, oh, before I before we go to that, let's see. Let's say hello to those that are say, saying hello to us. And uh, looks like we've got a good. It's a good time to go ahead and roll that video. Are you ready, Roger? Ready. Roller. And, uh, okay. I'd like my little open. Color is visual music. A single hue is like a single musical note. It's the repetition and the variation of notes that give us an audible melody in music, just like it's the repetition and variation of color in painting that gives us a visual melody. How we do the varying and repeating of color can determine the success of our paintings. 
We can repeat color in two ways, by placing the same hue of a color in other places in our painting, or by repeating a hue with an analogous hue. For example, we can repeat orange as orange in different places within the painting, or we can repeat the hue orange with yellow orange in various places on the painting. And there are three ways we can vary color in our paintings. We can vary the hue itself, we can vary the value of the hue, and we can vary the saturation of the hue. For example, we can take the hue yellow-orange, we can add to it the hue yellow, and still have yellow-orange, or we can add to it the hue orange and still have yellow orange. That's varying hue with hue. We can take the same yellow orange and we can make it a little lighter with in value, still have yellow orange, a little lighter even in value, still have yellow orange. We can make it a little darker in value and still have yellow orange, a bit darker even still, and have yellow orange. That's varying hue with value. And we can take the same yellow orange, add a little blue violet to it, and we have a yellow orange that is slightly desaturated. We add a little bit more blue violet, get more desaturation. More blue violet, even more desaturated. Add more blue violet and almost totally desaturated. That's varying hue with saturation. Let's use this painting by David Tanner called Boy with Mandolin as a good example of using repeating and varying color. I want to use both my color reader and the color wheel as we're doing this. Overall, the two major hue ranges we see in David's painting, on this side of the wheel he has used the full range of from primary to primary of red to yellow, almost the full range. On this side, he's used the blue-green primarily. In some cases, the blue-green is leaning a little bit more towards blue, uh, and it doesn't really lean more towards green than uh, we have right here. So we have these this complementary pair of hues against the oranges and red oranges over here at, with that full range. So that's a complementary relationship in a broad sense of the term. We start with the warm hues, and we start way back here in the background. We see here very low saturation, very light value of the hue red. We see it repeated throughout in here and even down in here, really desaturated here, but still a very little bit of the hue red showing. We do see that repeated all the way down and the hue red repeated down here. We see it in variations in value. We see it darker here, lighter here. We see it in variations of saturation here. You can see right here on the color reader. Here, it's more highly saturated than it is here, still in the red range. We see it varied in value in that this is very light, and then the values get darker in, in this range. Now, moving in this direction on the color wheel, if we go into the skin tones, we see the reds still being repeated in skin tones, repeated and varied in that they are beginning to also lean a little bit more towards the red-orange. Now, back down in the feet, we see the reds repeated and varied in value and in saturation. We see it repeated here. We see them repeated here. We see them repeated in skin tones here. We see them repeated in the skin tones here. We see that even repeated in a very low saturation in the blues. Look at all those places 
where he's used a very low saturation. And notice that where he's placed it in the blues, he's kept the value pretty much in the same value range as the blues themselves are, which is a wonderful way to repeat uh, hues that are so different from each other. And we see it repeated down here in the blues. We see it repeated in here. So he's really done a lot of really strategic repetition of those reds and reds leaning towards red orange. We see here the reds in this desaturated and very light value in this area are repeated more towards red orange. So that's hue repeated red repeated in red orange and then varied with it leaning towards red orange. In other words, the, the hue is varied uh, varied and repeated. And then we see this red orange being repeated throughout the trousers in various values, very dark, repeated in uh, varied in value, very, getting a little bit lighter here. Uh, and here we see the, uh, the red orange is going a little bit more towards orange. Uh, in areas they go towards orange, and in areas that come back towards red orange. That's varying. One thing he's done here that makes this such a rich little painting, all the little variations of hues, values, and saturations. And we see those oranges to red oranges repeated throughout in the trousers, into the mandolin, into the skin tones of the hand. And, and in this direction, same thing with this hand repeated repeated through the suspenders, up through the neck, even repeated somewhat on the on the collar, repeated all in here. And then we see the red oranges moving more towards orange here. See here and here. You see what he's see what I'm going through here. I'm going through the progression on the wheel from red to red, orange to orange, etc. So we see the oranges being repeated. It's going towards orange here. Oranges in the mandolin, we see them repeated here, we see them repeated in, the oranges repeated in the shadows of the shirt, we see them repeated here, we see them repeated here, 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 and somewhat here in a very low saturation down in this area. And then the, or the oranges merge into yellow oranges that we see in the shirt. You see, all of that just blends together in our eyes, and yet the variation of the hue changing from orange into yellow orange gives us the variation, gives us the richness, whereas the repetition of yellow within all that gives us the unity or harmony, color harmony. So we see here the yellow is really closer to yellow orange. It, it's not exactly yellow. Now, in these light areas, it becomes more yellow. Uh, it registers in the yellow range in the lighter areas. But then as it moves into shadow, we can see it's moving more towards orange and very desaturated. See right here, if I pull that, if I pull that uh, saturation nodule up towards the full saturation, you see right there, this is pretty much registering uh, the hue that we, overall hue we read here. So we see he's got a very desaturated uh, yellow, yellow to yellow orange. As we move, as it moves more into shadow, it seems to get more desaturated. And yet it's still reading as yellow orange. That's variation. The hue is varying in saturation, or you might say in degree of saturation. And then we see that repeated somewhat down here in these yellow oranges and, uh, and oranges. In the cools, we see the blue, we see the blue-green repeated and varied. You can see how it's varied in hue here, varied in value, and varied in saturation. All together, repeat and vary. The hue is repeated but varied, all within this area one thing that gives it the richness. We see this here repeated, very desaturated in all these neutral areas 
especially in the brushes here. And you can see it repeated as it comes down here, repeated on the palette here, and the blue repeated down here uh, much more strongly. The, sat the hue uh, being darker and in places more saturated, in places less saturated. We see that hue of blue repeated here, blue-green. The hue of blue-green repeated in here and here and here. So that is just a brief review of what David has done here. Now, the overall effect of what he has done, he's using those complementary hues of blue-green blue and that range of oranges. The blues emphasize the oranges visually, and the oranges emphasize the blues. But he's distributed those hues, those complementary relationships in such a way. We have a beautifully balanced piece as far as the color goes, well, as far as everything goes, but especially in his use of repetition of color. And you can see now uh, how the repetition or how he's arranged by the way he's placed, where he's placed these colors, these blues especially, guides the eye right around and right through all those warm colors. So we see in action right here how compliments complement each other, emphasize each other, while at the same time harmony is achieved with all the repetition. The variation within that repetition gives us the richness that we see there. Let's stop now and give you a chance to ask your questions. All right, folks, I'm ready now for the questions. Did, did the video, the, the, did the points I made in the video stimulate any, uh, any questions with you, or is this something you already knew? Is this something you're already a master of? Have, have we been redundant in our, uh, in our topic for the day? Uh, so ready for your questions. Um, is the color reader an app? <laughs> The color reader is in an app. The app is called Art Rage. Uh, it is, um, you can just Google it online. It's, it's an app that was built for painters. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles that you have in those big heavy apps like Photoshop and all those others that do have color readers. But this one is made especially for the painter. Uh, and, and the app, the color reader, then is built into that and I, I usually just uh, bring whatever images I'm using into the app and then use the color reader. So I hope it hope that explains that. All right, do we have, is, are, is that the only question? Uh, you know, we, the, 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 this concept of, of uh, especially of varying color is one that uh, often people um, neglect to do when they're working in those color greens. Hold on a minute. Let's see. If, if you want to mix a tan, if you want to mix a tan, let's say, which is the value, uh, which the value is very light, do you start with the lightest value first? Uh, it I think it really works better for any value you're mixing if you start with the darkest value first because usually in those dark value are the colors that the the, the, um, the colors that come out of the tubes the values the darker values are richer and and uh, that's not to say that if you if you end up with a lighter value that you want to make darker that you uh, can't add darker color in, you can. But it's a lot easier to control the value if you start out in a mixture uh, with the value a little dar a darker or a little darker than the eventual value that you're aiming for, no matter whether it, no matter what the eventual color is that you're trying to mix. I hope I got that right, Cindy. Um, Okay, let's see. What else do we have? 
I hope that one was answering it. Okay, what I was about to say while I'm waiting for other questions, I guess maybe everybody already knows this stuff, huh? Um, the one thing that we hear from uh, comments people make about paintings that they see online, especially, but even before on uh, before painting before online was available for paintings, uh, one of the comments that we constantly hear uh, would be that uh, when when a subject is green, like a subject has a lots of green in it, we hear that comment is too green. Well. A lot of times, the issue of green is not the fact of green, but it's the failure to, not the failure, it is that the artist was not seeing and varying the greens themselves according to how they might vary in hue. In other words, certain areas of green, if you look out at foliage or out at a... Uh, any area that uh, a, a, a pasture or any area that is in the green range, you'll see that it fluctuates. You're not only seeing just a uh, a, a green, the green as a secondary color, uh, color, secondary hue green, but you'll see those hues vary. You see some of those greens going more yellow green, and you'll see some of those greens going more blue green. And not only do you see that, but you'll see within that with some, with some going more yellow green, some going more blue green, you'll see that some of the greens are losing some of their saturation. And then you also see a losing or gaining, but mostly you see the saturations are, are less than you really think they are. And then you also see those value variations. A lot of people will uh, average out a value in a painting where if we show just a little nuance, a slight one or two degree change in value, it creates a lot more depth than energy in the painting. But the other thing also is that many times when we're looking at, at a green landscape, that within those greens we're going to see other color, other hues reflected. And a lot of times people in the, uh, are looking at it as green and, and they really not seeing those variations not really seeing those other colors register. So that's one thing, uh, one area where uh, I see a lot of, um, uh, what would you say, if, uh, a lot of if the person were actually conscious of varying the, the, the hues that they see, the painting would be a lot richer. Another place I see it, I uh, see color often um, what would you say, not, not, uh, uh, a little flat, let's just call it that, let's say, a lot of times the colors can be flat in portraits, in portrait work. Now, if you'll notice in the skin tones of this little painting I showed you by da uh, uh, David Tanner, did you notice how the skin tones vary in hue as well? Uh, of course, we, you know, usually people will, will change the value of the, the value uh, a lot of times is not where the problem is. A lot of times the problem is in actually seeing um, hues vary within the tones themselves as the light changes or as, uh, as uh, other colors might be reflecting on the face depending on the surroundings a person is in. Um, and sometimes just enhancing that as a way of making the image a lot richer uh, a, a lot of people will not see that. And and so there are reasons to really hone your ability to see these three ways of varying and also to see how the repetition uh, works as far as keeping those variations from causing a chaotic image. Well, I hope I didn't bring that one out too much. Now, Rich says... So if you want to mix some complementary strokes into a color, the key is to desaturate. Uh, well, the key is to keep the value the same, Rich. When when we are mixing, uh, when we're using, it, it, it's just what you're saying when you want to mix some complementary strokes into a color. And so, yeah, you're saying the first consideration is keep it in the same value range, but 
it could be that it might need to be more desaturated, or in some cases, the stroke might need to be more saturated. But if it's the same value range, then the eye blends the value and it enables that hue uh, to, you might say, um, work, do, uh, do its thing against the hue surrounding it. I like to say that color talks to color. Color talks to color. And one thing you might consider there, when uh, considering that whole concept, uh, color, the hue, did I say this in the video? I don't remember if I did. But um, color, hue, hue itself has a kind of a magnetic um, influence on itself. If you'll notice what your eyes will do, if there is a is that if there is a hue in some place and then another hue somewhere else, your eye will follow that hue. If there's a change in hue, uh, one a single hue in one place, it's different from all the others hues around it, and then another hue pops up, your eye's going to follow that, and then another hue. So your eye will actually follow the hues, the similar hues. Your eye your eye will actually follow similar hues. Uh, as they are distributed according to how they're distributed through a painting. Well, taking that consideration, your eye also uh, causes, because of the way your eye receives the hues, the various hues that we have available, the ones that are di so different from each other cause each other, emphasize each other. You know, um, things that are different really emphasize things well, how could I say, when we have two things that are different, they emphasize each other. And so the, the further the hues are uh, in their relationship on the color wheel, the more they emphasize each other. So if the two hues that you're, when you're stroking a, a different hue into an area, then if it is uh, that different, the closer it is in value, the more it's going to blend with it. But then the further it is in hue, the more depth or vibration you might say it's going to give it. I, I probably really did run that one into the ground. It's color. It's, it's a subject that really fascinates me, though, because what uh, we remember is these are not. This is not just theory that we uh, where we we somebody sat over in the corner and created a bunch of rules for you to follow. What happens with color? Is related to what happens in our eyes. Now, if, if your eye, if your cones, if your cones, the cones in your eyes, the cones and rods in your eyes are receiving in kind of a normal way. You know, although, although our cones, various cones, do have variations in their reception, and that causes slight differences in perception sometimes. But uh, unless you're color blind, or unless something's wrong with the cones in your eyes. Uh, your eyes are going to uh, receive these colors according to what those colors do to each other. And that's the thing, one thing that makes it so beautiful that our make, it also makes a color such a wonderful language to work with is that what we're doing is we, when, when we're putting these colors in their various locations on our, on our painting surfaces, we're we're talking to people's eyes. We're communicating with people's eyes. The eyes are receiving that, and the eyes receive it. And then when the eyes receive it, all the remote the the emotional responses or intellectual responses happen as a result of the eyes receiving that communication. So that's one thing that makes color so fascinating. All right, let's see what else. Uh, Patricia asked, what about varying the transparency? Well, transparency is a different um, a, a, a different thing altogether. The transparency is the um, ability to, to see through a hue, see another, see one, see see through a hue into another hue, and that's going to change. Change it if those hues are different. If something's totally transparent, you can think about if you have a, um, a, a piece of acetate that is the color blue, for example, and let's say you have a key, piece of acetate, well, let's just call it blue for the time being, 
when you hold it up and look through it, that's transparency because that transparency allows you to, to blend that color that's within it into the color behind it. If then you hold up a, a piece of uh, just a plain um, typing paper, we used to call it printer paper, we'd call it now, you don't, you don't see what's behind it. So that's opaque. Now, there, the, the, what we might call degrees of transparency and opaqueness is the kind of thing that we take in consideration when we're doing images with like with fog or rain or images where something in our atmosphere will create a block of some sort. So as far as what we're interpreting, that would be a consideration. But usually in the painting process, the consideration have, has to do with which painting technique are you using? If you're using the direct painting technique where you're mixing your colors as you go and uh, following that process as opposed to the layered technique, the layered technique has many different ways to begin, but with the layered technique you, you lay down a set of colors and then you lay glazes over or in the, the uh, traditional, original, layered technique was starting out with the Gasai, which is a um, painting in value, black and white, or not black and white necessarily, it could be green, tones of green or, or of olive green, a very, very low uh, saturation of green, or it could have been browns or siennas. Uh, I'm going all, all the way back to Renaissance and pre-Renaissance now and thinking about uh, the emerging of that technique. But um, where the transparent layers were built, where uh, especially over the darkest darks, as the transparent layers get built, they are adding color upon color upon color. Well, then you reach that point where you're going into these uh, middle values and lights, and that's going to require more opaqueness. And so there then, the, the layers themselves might be a little bit more like semi-transparent, but that is, uh, you, you, that's not going to affect how hue relates to hue or how uh, color, I mean, uh, how hue is repeated against hue. So what we got there? Anyway, anyway I hope I answered that. So, so I said the transparency and opaqueness are um, a technique of working and a result of working, but their their um, interpretation of color or their our interpretation of color through the transparency and the technique and transparency and opaqueness is going to have to do more with uh, the feeling of the surface depth than it does the actual color relationship. I'm not so sure I made that clear. I might have made it more confusing than than clear itself. So let me know, Patricia. Did did I um, did I confuse you more on that one? Let's see, transparent opaque pigment. Yeah, yeah. Um, materials are one thing, but what? Uh, how those materials? The, the amount of hue, or or the the amount of hue, the kind of hue, the um, the value of the hue, or the the saturation degree of saturation of the hue that's in those pigments. Um, that's something else. So that, well, I think what I'm really trying to say there is that all those characteristics could be in either transparent, transparent or opaque colors. It's just that it's the reflective quality of the color that is is different, not not the uh, hue itself, or not the what's happening to the hue itself. Does thin, does thinning out opaque paint cause it to be transparent? Yes, it does cause it, it but not total transparent. If you thin out opaque paint, uh, if you get it very, very thin, you, you're just going to have particles of paint floating in there that you'll be able to see. It's very, I don't, I'm not sure it's even possible to get a total transparent uh, color out of thinning an opaque color. Because here's the difference in the, the opaque, the transparent colors 
The particles are tiny, 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 almost microscopic, tiny. That's what causes them to be transparent. They sort of melt in the medium, in the binder itself. Whereas the opaque colors, the particles are larger and they're they're more compact. And so they, they don't they don't they block the light. They block the the light rather than uh, rather than allowing the light to pass through. So uh, that I don't know. What do you think? Did I answer that? Okay. Patricia, uh, yes, I did follow that. I've been thinking fourth dimension of color. Fourth dimension of color? What would that be? Fourth dimension of color? Huh? Quantum color. Quantum color. Yeah, okay, that gets away um, almost beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I, I think maybe the thing to do is to think about more perception of color. Let's, let's not even try to think in two dimension or three dimension, but just think in perception of color itself as a as an element, a visual element, um, a perception of color, and then what creates color as an as an element, just a single element, and take those things, three things that create color and then examine what does each of those components do. And then as a result of how we use that, we can get into uh, various dimensions perhaps, our exploration. But I, I, I'm more, my, in teaching, in teaching my, my uh, tendency is to break it down to the very nth degree. So the concern, first of all, is if we know what something is made of, then we can understand how it works. And if we understand how it works, then we can better understand how to use it. So, so if we know then that color, as color, is a single element that causes us to see uh, See what we, causes us to see that component of images. So we know that there are certain visual elements that make up every image we see, and that color is one of them, or the lack of. All right, so let me get back to the, the bare in, so, so we take the single element of color, and once again, I'm going to repeat myself. I already look at it by itself. What causes it to be color? Well, it has three things that cause it to be color. Three things, not just one, but three. And the major thing is hue. That's the that's what we that's what appears in the rainbow. That's the hue. That's what appears on the color wheel. That's the hue. It's how we identify it. How we identify yellow as yellow, blue is blue, red is red, green is green, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's hue. But then what happens to that hue when the when it's on the surface when it's when it's a uh, Describing a surface and the light hits it. Well, the hue change the hue changes in value. What happens when it goes in the shower? It changes in value in the other direction. So now color has two components: hue and value. Well, then what happens when that hue itself um, has other hues added into it? Well, they change in hue. Well, what if that hue itself has a, another hue added into it that has nothing in common with it? For example, if uh, violet has nothing in common with yellow, yellow is yellow, violet is made of red and blue, they have nothing in common hue-wise, but when, when you start then adding one into the other, it subtracts the amount of hue from that color, that's the saturation principle, or we call it intensity. Other people, some people call it chroma. That gives us a third component. So then there are three things that cause color to be color. Now, that's where I'm going with this stuff. It's those three things, how we use those three things, that give us that depth that we all desire in our painting that vibrancy we all desire in our painting, that energy that we all desire in our painting, 
It's how Richard Schmidt uses color versus how, I won't call any names who use color. Uh, but you, you sometimes you see, it's the difference between when you see uh, a color appear, I mean a painting appear on the internet, maybe on Facebook, um, and uh, say a color of sunflowers, and it seems flat. And the person necessarily is not trying intentionally making it flat, it just seems flat. Uh, well, as opposed to maybe another sunflower you might see painted by, I'm going to say Richard Schmidt because he's a, he was a master of color. He has never feel flat. Why? Because he's using those three components all the time. Every brush stroke is a consideration of what each component is doing. It may not be a conscious consideration because it doesn't have to be. But it's a consider it, it, it every brush stroke is the colors variation working in those three ways I named. And then um, so so that you see where that can take you. I mean you can take that in consideration. I don't know, how did I get off on that? I sort of went on a bender there. Um but I wanted to take I I'll I'll get I'll, maybe I'll get off that one just a moment, take a question. It says, Fiona, did I pronounce your name right? I hope my landscapes are probably too green. I try to think hue value saturation. I guess this should be worked out in smaller studies before painting. Yet before the painting gets started. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Never practice on your performance while you're performing. Never practice while you're performing. Uh, that's one thing I would always advise you. We learn these skills in our practice rooms. We learn these skills when we're practicing small studies and when we're intentionally examining what these things do to each other. Uh, and that happens for the painter in sketchbooks or on, on scrap canvas or scrap watercolor or scrap paper of some sort on scrap surfaces. But that never should happen in a painting because your painting is your performance. And just as a concert is a musician's performance, a uh, a ball a baseball game is the baseball pitcher's performance. But the baseball pitcher, the really good baseball pitchers, do a heck of a lot of practicing in in um, in all the ways their body moves and the ways they hold the ball and all these psychological elements they have to build in. All that goes on back on uh, during the practice sessions never on the field. And when it does happen on the field, it never works out. So I think that when we, and here's the payoff of that. Oh yes, it has a great payoff. When you practice, it becomes a part of your automatic process. The ideal way to paint is to not have to think about that stuff, but that your eyes guide you. You're, you look at the subject, your eyes automatically register what's there and how you can get it because you have practice, because you have gone through the practice exercises that enabled you not only to see that, but to mix the colors and know where to put them and that sort of thing. So I would say, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Do all your practice uh, before the performance, never during the performance. Uh, Patricia says, uh, ah, thanks, I understand now. Each brush stroke is a sentence in a novel. Yes, indeed. That's good. That's really good. Each brush stroke, each brush stroke is a sentence in a novel. That is really, really good. Yeah, you know, we painters too often forget that um, there are parallels in what we do in writing novels, writing poetry, in uh, creating music, in performing music, in dancing, in theater, in the in the in the art of acting which I never could do, uh, in the sports, there are parallels everywhere. Uh, so, er, so for every sentence that will be written in a novel, yes, that's a really good parallel. I love that, Patricia. I may steal that from you sometime. If you see it in one of my books, I, I don't claim copyright. Because <laughs> it may just surface and... I'll say somewhere I remember somebody saying 
Uh, each brush stroke is a sentence on novel. I, 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 but I really like that. Can you tell? <laughs> so, um, all right. Do you have any other questions? If we don't see any other questions, we're just going to have to sign off because I'll assume that you know exactly how to use all this stuff and you just can't wait to go try it out. Some, uh, uh, we're speaking of the, back to the question that I think Fiona asked. Yes, you're welcome, Fiona. Back to that question, um, you may wonder, well, what exercises do I do? Well, every quick tip, we have, how many now, 430-something, 440, what are we going towards 250 quick tips? I don't know, we've been doing quick tips all of, almost, seems like almost all of our lives. Every one of those quick tips is an opportunity for you to practice. If you, if, you, if you watch the quick tip and then take yourself through the exercise I'm doing, not just once, once is never a practice, once is an experiment, once is just trying it out. The real practice comes when you, contain, when you do that same thing over and over again, even, even if you use different, like if you're doing different colors or whatever. But we have a number, quite, I don't even know how many, a number of quick tips on color, just on, on how color behaves. And you could go through those quick tips and take them one at a time and do and practice the dickens out of them, of every quick tip to the point you feel that you know it as well as I do, and you can. Uh, and then you'll be surprised at how that's going to open up your, uh, your, your awareness of not only seeing color, but actually using color in your paintings in a, in a masterful way. Uh, using color not only just to describe, but when you describe, you describe with richness. When you describe a portrait, you describe with richness, not just with one color that you change the value of, uh, but you're, you're using color as color. You're, you're seeing color changes. You will train your eyes to and your awareness, and once you learn it, you don't lose it. That's the beauty of the whole thing. It's sort of like riding the bicycle. Once you learn it, you don't you, you don't lose it. So uh, go through if, if if that would be what I'd recommend. There are always exercises for you to do. There's always guidance, and I can now say that um, you can always go to the quick tips and find the guidance you need. And I can also say that uh, beyond the quick tips, we have other guidances. I, I try not to use these. Um, I try not to use these YouTube chats to promote our um, the things that we charge for. But your quick tips are free. They're there. They're there for you. And you can watch them as many times as you want to. And if you buy uh, the lesson downloads from the lesson site, uh, the, you pay $7 a lesson. <laughs> and then you, you download it onto your computer or, or onto your device of some sort. Watch it as many times as you want to, for as long as you want to. Uh, the the uh, courses are a little different, because the courses you're taking, you're studying it as a course, not just as individual little lessons. But there's always instruction out there, is what I'm trying to say. Always ways to practice. Okay, uh, Mary Ellen says, Diane, can you talk a bit about the art artwork behind you? <laughs> Where did that come from? Does that Van Gogh himself, or is that someone? Is that a, it? Doesn't look like a Van. It looks like someone imitating Van Gogh. I think it. What's that flashing? Oh, is that you? Okay. I'm not flashing. Okay. Um, well, what we have behind Toulouse Lautrec. I knew. I, I couldn't. I couldn't think. Yeah, it's Toulouse Lautrec. What we have here is. Uh, I'm going to talk a, for, for purely in terms of the repetition and variation of hue. Okay, and I probably need to get out of the way. But what we have here, you can see, the repetition. Of, if you start, say, say if you start over. Here we go over here in this corner. You, you see the hue yellow that leans towards yellow orange, and then you see the variations within there. It's not just one, it's not just one registration of the hue yellow, but you can see that you can see, if you look really, really closely, you can see how that yellow goes 
uh, some of the little strokes go are yellow and some of them in the little strokes are yellow orange. The thing is made up of tiny little strokes and textures. And so it's little strokes of color, little broken color. And then you can see how that yellow will change into yellow green. So he's got variations of yellow uh, in those areas of yellow all the way through. And then we have it over here. The yellow gets repeated in the orange and then the yellow orange. So you have a transition in the yellow here that moves in this direction towards the, the oranges and yellow oranges. And then I'm looking in the background now. And you can see how, let me get over here and get out of the way. You can see how in here we have on the face, we have still that repetition of yellow. You see yellow repeated, 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 continue to be repeated, repeated in here. And then you see the yellow transitioning into the orange, which is analogous to yellow. Uh, so yellow moves from yellow through yellow. Yellow moves from yellow into orange, into red, or yellow orange, and down here into red orange. And then you can see those variations going on. So he's broken down, <coughs> pardon me, he's broken down in little tiny strokes, uh, what we would normally do with a single brush stroke, that sort of thing. And you can see how the whole thing now in the foreground, we can see that those that color of yellow, the hue of yellow, uh, yellow to yellow orange, it's that same range that David used within his yellows, except these are higher saturations, although some of them, the very saturation does value, does uh, vary, but then we can see how that, that continues to repeat as it, over here we see it getting a little darker. The saturation is probably just a little bit richer in some places, less and less in others. We see the oranges and yellow, uh, oranges and red orange then repeated within that context of yellow. Uh, and you can see that, through, and then you can see on this side, how you see how now in the coat in the in the jacket here we have the red leaning towards orange so we have red leaning towards orange. now all that is color harmony the background you can see here yellow carries through now look at what the blue is doing against that um, see that we have yellow and yellow orange the blue against that is actually enhancing you can see the blue in the background then as it comes through here you see the blue going through the figure's head and here you see the blue continue to be repeated and you can see a parallel here with what between what he's done in this and what you i pointed out to you in the in the video at the beginning of the session i pointed out to you i followed through how david tanner was carrying that uh, using that color as a path as a visual path the blue is you see how the blue continues to be repeated through the oranges, red oranges, and yellows. And then you can see now how those colors sort of play together. So that is sort of a, a dirty, very down and dirty uh, analysis of what's going on with that. Um, and then you can see the variation. The blue the blue he's used there, he's pretty much used that blue hue that leans. It's a little bit more like the ultramarine blue that we're used to, that uh, a combination of ultramarine blue and maybe cobalt. But I think he's just used one one crayon there. I think it may be pastel crayons or, or a gray crayons or something like that. Can't remember. But anyway, uh, you can see that is that blue that registers the blue, leaning a little bit towards blue violet there. And he uh, he only he goes in a little bit a little bit right up in here, a little bit towards uh, the blue, leaning towards green. But most of that blue is is cooler. And same thing up here with the blue violets as they go in this direction right here. You can see it's blue leaning towards, tin is leaning towards violet more than it is leaning towards green. So that creates even more tension. Uh, throw the color wheel. Can you throw the color wheel for that just for a moment? Roger, let me show, let me talk about that for just a minute. Um, yeah, there we go, there we go. Now, um, so if we're looking at the color wheel here, we can see <laughs> my hands, but that, that's good. I like my hand being behind it because that's good. That's clever. All right. So you can see the relationship. We see blue. All uh, the way the way color works. Not only are complements uh, used together, but complementary ranges. Let me, let me get myself. I'm on the other side, so I can see. Yeah, the complementary ranges. So we've got a range here that goes 
uh, in the oranges uh, to orange, and then I'm having trouble here following because I'm moving backwards. Orange, yellow orange, then to orange, then to red orange. That's a range of analogous colors uh, built on the orange hue. And across from that, we have that range of blue that leans towards blue violet on this side and then leans towards uh, blue green on the other side right here. Now that is a complementary range, but you see, uh, we can use complementary ranges of colors, not just complements uh, of each other. We can use complementary ranges of other, like he's done here, although he's used more of this range right here of the blue to blue violet, and more of that range where he's used a broader range on the warm side. They still, they'll have that same kind of relationship to each other because of how color, uh, how color differences behave when they're put side by side. All right, I don't know what, what, I, what I do the whole picture. Oh, you did that. Oh, what happened to it? I changed it so you, you can see the whole thing. Ah, oh, oh, okay. Do I need to get out of the way? <laughs> There's the whole thing. <laughs> okay. All right, well, all right, we're getting down to the finish line. I want to uh, see, um, uh, I guess maybe Mary Ellen, I guess I did okay. It's fascinating. All right, now, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to change the subject just, to, just a moment here because I've got something for you. Uh, if you're going to have to, did you, did you find it, Roger? Yeah. You found it? Yep. Oh, cool. Cool. You gonna flash it up? Whoops. That's not. The <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got it. Okay. You see this? You see that? That is a coupon code. Now, everybody who's attended this session with us today, and everybody who watches this replay, the, the all of our all of our uh, chats are uh, recorded and they go on replay there you go to the channel our channel click on live and they're all right there all of our chats are right there everybody who watches this chat or who has attended this chat can use this coupon code to get 20 percent off all our courses on our academy now our academy is the one place where we teach full length Courses, and every single course is is a comp is is one of these composing things I talk about in these chats all the time. I take a single concept and we build a complete course out of it. So we have concepts, and we keep adding new courses all the time. We used to start these courses out as workshops. That gives them a real test, and then we take those same that same set of videos and. Trans, uh, are we, we we convert them into a full course over on the academy. So the academy, you do your work right there. You, you, uh, it's paced. Uh, you you self pace it. it is not paced. It's so that you can self pace. You can sign up for a course. You can take it at your own uh, speed. And when you finish that course, you'll get a certificate there. It's the only place where we give certificates. So this is this is the this is the uh, coupon code. You can get twenty percent off on if you go there. If you want more than one course, then put then buy more than one course together because the coupons are, are one. I mean, you can use it once. Each person can use it once. June twenty five chat. That means today's the twenty fifth. This is the month of June, and this is the chat we had on June the twenty fifth. I tried to get something we can remember. So there it is, all lowercase. Go to dianemiceacademy.com. I might note here, my name, Diane, has two N's in it. My mother did that to me. It's D-I-A-N-N-E-M-I-Z-E A-C-A Academy, A-C-A-D-E-M-Y dot com. And uh, browse through there. Select the course. A lot, a lot of you, saw, a number of you have already started work on the academy we're getting some really positive feedback about that but i thought it would be really a fun thing to do here we are at the beginning of summer let's get the summer started off right and let's give you a little gift of appreciation for watching our, our chat with us today 
and also to those that will be watching uh, after it's recorded, a little appreciation to them too. All right, so our time, uh, well, the old mother clock is already set on three, so it's time to wrap this up. Well, appreciate it. Thank you all so much for watching, uh, joining us today. And uh, all I can say is happy color, and hope you'll join us next time. So bye-bye for now.